What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash and today is June 13th of 2020. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video, we're not only going to be spending some time to take a long-term perspective on some of the major catalysts and moves in the cryptocurrency space between altcoins as well as Bitcoin, but outside that as well, talking about what's going on in regards to Fed monetary policy and taking a look at treasury yields out of all things to see what it's telling us or what the market is telling us about what the Fed is going to do next. I can give you a hint, it's gonna be more QE and a possible hint of negative interest rates. We've got lots more to go throughout the video right after our quick sponsor. Our sponsor for today's episode is Bitpanda Pro. If you're on the hunt for a proven, trustworthy exchange in Europe to trade your crypto, then I recommend taking a look at Bitpanda. If you're just getting started, many people refer to Bitpanda as the European Coinbase, so it can be a great place to start in getting your first crypto positions. With over five years of experience serving the industry by offering easy and secure access to digital currencies, Bitpanda has really earned its reputation. Check out the link down below in the description for more information. Alrighty, everyone. So let's go ahead and take a quick look across the board for crypto markets from the top three plays to the broader market. The vast majority of cryptocurrencies are in a no trend scenario right now, with very few exceptions in red territory, as well as a few holding up here in the green. So the top three plays being Verge, Sycoin, and Komodo, three legacy plays in the cryptocurrency space, all of which are in double digit territory. However, again, not much has changed since we last talked, and that's why today I want to spend some time to talk a little bit about the broader term time frame and look for some comparisons to history for what we can look forward to over the next few months. So, interestingly enough, if you guys have been possibly looking you know, at the kind of day-to-day -day time frames for Ethereum and a few of the altcoins, it might seem that things are turning pretty positive. And if you take an even further step back and look at the weekly or the monthly, you'll start to see an even more justifiable trend that could you know, showcase reason to be pretty excited about altcoins. Again, as you all know, I don't like to be biased about this. I don't have a, you know, a personal love for any specific altcoin project over per se Bitcoin, uh, right? I'm not a maximalist. And the reason I'm not a maximalist is because I like to keep my opportunities open to every single market possible. And I like a lot of different types of assets. I can like many stocks as I like many companies. I like many precious metals like gold and silver. And I also like many cryptocurrencies just like I like Bitcoin, right? So I try to keep a non-biased perspective on what I can read from the market. And what's interesting is that we're seeing a lot of similarities to the beginning stages of the previous altcoin cycle. Now, as many of you know, before I dive into my kind of analysis of this, because it's quite simple, um, I've, I've mentioned in the past that usually we're not going to get our first altcoin cycle until we get back up to 20K. And to be fair with you, we'll dive into that as well, talking about Bitcoin. Um, as much as I do believe that that could be the case, we might have to wait until we really get the big kahuna, the big move in altcoins until we get to, up to 20K. Again, doesn't mean that we can't start seeing a beginning of the trend earlier and that we might diverge a tad bit off the trend from what we've seen previously. What I do love seeing, though, is a major consistency in something that I like to use as a naked trader. As a naked trader, and know where I've got clothes on, I look for support and resistance as well as general price levels. I look for higher lows or lower highs and a higher lows and lower lows, right? I look for all these different kinds of patterns on price and for what they tell me. And we can see here, if we take a look at the weekly chart, we're getting a good broad range of price, uh, the altcoin dominance, or excuse me, Bitcoin dominance in this case, right? We usually look at altcoin dominance, but we're gonna look at it in the form of Bitcoin dominance today, all the way back from 2015 to the modern world today. And we've been talking since back here in September that as we started to see Bitcoin dominance from back here in 2018 rally up, that we were gonna start hitting some resistance and possibly get altcoins coming down. And so far we've been dead on with that call. It's been, it was one of our best calls in 2019 back in September as we started to see a reversal here, a sharp decline here, and we started to set in a low, excuse me, a high here that was in line with previous resistance back here in 2017. However, the thing that I wanted to look for here to really confirm my position that I was confident that altcoins were going to probably start to take over and start to gain market dominance was a consistency of lower highs. And that's exactly what we saw back here. So not even, again, just trying to put in my personal bias into what I look for in trading. We can turn off our drawings here. You can see here very clearly that it started off with a stark decline, a change in trend here, where we dropped about 3% setting it a lower high on Bitcoin dominance, a third lower high, right? Again, if you want to consider it a second lower high, if you're just, you know, not even counting the first one, here, that's fine, right? But you can even go back here, right? We had a really technically, we did have three lower highs here. And you can start to see that the pressure built up more and more until it couldn't handle it anymore. Altcoin 
uh, altcoins turned exponential, people got very excited, and Bitcoin started to lose ground in the market. That doesn't mean that Bitcoin lost out, it just didn't gain as fast as altcoins were because it's more difficult for a large cap asset to multiply times and times over again when you have smaller mid caps that have much more room to grow. And it's the same comparison I make with Bitcoin to gold. So again, just taking that step back here, and taking a look at the similarities that we have, the lower highs here that we're getting here, similarly with altcoins, excuse me, in regards to Bitcoin dominance as altcoins start to gain, I think now, as we're starting to coil into almost a short-term wedge here from back in September when we flipped, and then also here in February when we've started to kind of set in higher lows here for Bitcoin dominance on the shorter-term time frame, I think that we've got a real chance here for a breakdown in Bitcoin dominance to start forming and we start to see altcoins trending even higher. And we've started to see some of the warm up signs here. We've seen DeFi plays really starting to kick off into you know exponential rallies and right when you think they're over, they just continue going. Uh, this has been through Kyber Network, through Aave, uh, a lot of the longer term bullish plays like uh, Chainlink, a lot of these have been continued to hold out. Rin is doing well. So we have a lot of these different plays that are starting to really kick off their rallies and starting to show confidence. And I think this historical similarity is a good sign that we could be in an early stage of an altcoin cycle coming up here very soon. Right? And not to mention during this time period, even though the broader altcoin space hasn't really you know, kicked off yet, we've gone from 72% to 66% for market dominance for Bitcoin. So that's gains for the altcoin space in general. But in many plays like Kyber Network, we've four or five X our position comparative to Bitcoin. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if you're in the right place here, even in these early moves, you can benefit quite greatly if you start to make the right calls, right? Now, I want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin here because I know you guys don't always like if I just focus on altcoins. So, as much like as as much as I do with everything, I like to focus on other markets as well. And there's a really interesting similarity that I'm seeing here when I take a look at the monthly chart for Bitcoin. And the sense that's given me confidence that we're just a couple of months away from getting back above 20k. Now, the first thing I want to focus on is uh, the longer term chart, the expanding cycles. We've talked about this, how each new cycle usually expands by around 11 to 13 months. So in this case, we added 12 months for the previous one just to keep it neutral. And we're expecting some time for November 2022 to be the peak around 100K. That's a conservative price level compared to a lot of people out there who are calling for 200K, 300K, 500K. I like to keep it very, very conservative. And we'll see what happens as we get towards that time frame. However, what's interesting here is as we take a look here at the uh, two of the major moving averages I like to use on longer term time frames for Bitcoin, the 21 MA and also the 50 moving average here. Right? So we've got two of them here. The orange one is the 50, the blue one's the 21. I see a really interesting trend between these two moving averages. Not only a retest on the lows here two times on the 50 MA, but along with that as well, using the 21 MA as support here. And in fact, it's even more true this time around in the longer cycle that we have here. As we can see, the support here being held on the blue line and also a double retest here as we came down with the crazy sell off from uh, the plus token Ponzi scheme, the mass amount of leverage traders, and then also people, of course, just needing to go to cash during a time like COVID-19. So anyways, we can see here that there's a lot of interesting similarities between the moving averages. And the important thing to really keep in mind is how long did it take to get from this point on, right, around 400 something dollars upwards towards 1200 right took a couple of months right and i think this time around we're going to probably see a couple of months as well uh come into play here before we really get back up above 20,000, right so again we have to be patient on this we have to see what's going to happen here over the next coming weeks if we really get a break out above 10k if not you know again we're probably going to come push back down to 6,000, maybe test test the logarithmic line one more time who knows right but right now, I have to say that I at least like to see the historical similarities of the early stages of a formulation of an uptrend. And it makes me confident that we could just simply come up, right, come up and set a higher low here, maybe around 15K, push sideways, eventually come up here in early 2021, break above 20K, and have a nice slow grind upwards. But again, the one argument that I hear from uh, bears in the short term is that it takes time for these cycles to really build up. And once we get above 20K, it's not going to stop. And, you know, even though we have a big target of 100K, that it could start to make up the majority of those gains in a very short window of time, similar to what we've seen back in previous cycles in the past. So I wanted to go ahead and talk about equities now because we've got to talk about the craziness going on in traditional markets. We just the other day, technically, we're not exactly there just yet. 
but we are very close to, if you want to consider the even level peak of the dot-com bubble being $5,000, we just reached NASDAQ 10,000 the other day. Practically double the peak valuation of the dot-com bubble. It's truly incredible stuff, guys. Now, again, of course, tech companies are in a very different position uh, as, as why you could justify why tech stocks would be a, where they were over here in 2015. They're much in a, in a much different position in the sense of profitability, revenue, users, adoption uh, than where they were back here in the dot-com era. No doubt about that. However, this is a very significant chart, and we can see that even compared here to the dot-com era, the kind of sheer volatility and swings we've been seeing here in price, I mean, just the wicks here that we can see here on the, uh, the past six months has been incredible. And that's what we're looking at here. This is a six month uh, candle chart. So each of these candles represents six months. But you can just see the kind of sheer volatility and uncertainty that's been hanging on over these last couple of years. It really puts it in perspective, seeing the range that's traded here in a very simplified way. Now, what's interesting here, and what I want to dive into is a few different charts here from uh, the uh, Daily Shop Brief. It talks a little bit about Fed monetary policy, right? And it, it talks about kind of rewriting, uh, you know, kind of in, in simple, plain English, as well as some of the key changes and stuff in the Fed's narrative uh, that you should keep in mind. But broadly speaking, I mean, you can read through it. It talks again about the Fed really seeing again financial conditions improving, in part reflecting policy measures to support the economy. So whatever they're doing right now, from quantitative easing to lowering interest rates, this is obviously somehow bolstering the economy. I don't really see it bolstering much the real world economy, but I sure, certainly see it focusing on, uh, <laughs> you know, in regards to equity, uh, equity markets. So I think that's what they mean by the economy. That's their focus point. And along with that as well, coming down here. It said, to support the flow of credit to households and businesses over coming months, the Federal Reserve will increase its holdings of treasury securities and agency residential and commercial mortgage-backed securities in at least the, um, the current pace <laughs> to sustain smooth markets functioning, thereby fostering effective transmission of monetary policy to broader financial conditions. And they really love to use fancy language for basically we're going to be buying up all the other assets that people would be buying if they didn't buy equities. So now we're gonna basically force people to buy equities because we're buying up the mortgage-backed securities, we're buying up the treasuries, that liquidity has to go somewhere and it's probably gonna go into equities. It's gonna keep up propping up equity markets. And interestingly enough, you can see here, uh, more than anything, taking a look at bond markets and specifically government treasuries, you can see the very clear pace of what the market is intending Federal Reserve Monetary Policy to be. It's very important to realize that as bond yields are dropping, this means that there's probably going to be two things happening. The Fed is going to be buying up bonds, which drives yields down, right? The more the price of a bond goes up, the further the yield usually drops. That's historically true in all bond markets. Second off, it likely means that the Fed is cutting down interest rates. And the lower interest rates go, it's likely meaning that the lower the bond yield is going to go. Because if you can, for example, borrow liquidity from the Fed, right, at a specific interest rate, Let's say, for example, it's, um, and we can just keep it simple. We'll just go with 0%, right? Kind of the new reality that we're stepping into. 0% is back. It's the new norm. And if it's at 0%, you can borrow from the Fed, and you can just go out and buy up treasuries. There's a clear market incentive. There's a yield there for you. You can go buy those treasuries and basically print free money because you're going to get paid from the government to hold on to these treasuries, right? So what dichotomy does this lead us to? Well, it led us to the position back here in April where yields drop to practically nothing on the short-term time frames. If I could go buy out some short-term bonds, make 0.01% or 0.09%, you know, people would chase that yield because the federal funds rate was down to nearly zero to about 0.25 basis points. That's the general range that it traded through and the Fed maintained it through. And that's why the shorter-term yields not only turned towards practically zero, some of them dipped slightly into negative territory. And we can see that, of course, the yields have corrected back into maybe what might be seen as more normal territory and started to you know, flip on an uptrend. But don't think it's going to be lasting for long, guys, because on the daily here, where we started to see actually for the first time in the past few months a substantial gain in the five-year yield, all those gains were dropped just as quick. And we're back down to the baseline that we've been holding back here since March. Taking a look here at the 10-year yield, right? Coming down here, slamming down any gains we had back towards the general bottom territory that we've had here for the last few months. Take a look at the 20-year yield. Take a look at the daily here. Got a nice big spike here in the yield from around 1.2 to 1.5, going down to 1.238. 
it's basically back down to where we were, square one. And along with that, the 30-year, cutting down all those gains in the exact same period of time at 1.46. Okay. Still definitely higher from where we were back here in March. A little bit of relief to the economy, some confidence compared to where we were back there, where there was the idea that you know the Fed and, and no one in the world could do nothing to, to get uh, you know the general market back in action. But you can notice here that we haven't had any substantial return. If you take a look on a longer term time frame, this is where we're at right now on these longer term yields. And it's important to realize that this is probably the best indicator you can use to see what the Fed is going to do next. The market is pricing these things in. Treasury markets are so large that one way or another, word gets out. And you can start to be confident about where the Fed's going. And honestly, the Fed kind of makes it easy. Anytime they say they're not going to do something, they end up usually doing something. So uh, if they've said that they're not going to be issuing negative interest rates and that they're going to be tapering quantitative easing and entering into maybe Q, uh, quantitative tightening eventually in the next few years, you can probably guess that they're going to continue quantitative easing for the next couple of years and they're going to definitely enter into negative interest rates. And where the Fed goes, other central banks follow. So... Anyways, I hope you guys I hope you guys enjoyed this video in regards to uh, all the kind of broader macro topics, taking a look at the longer term perspective. Keep all of this in mind when you're taking a look at the broader altcoin space, when you're looking at Bitcoin as an asset. These are the assets we want to keep an eye on as we go into this territory of trillions of dollars being locked up in markets that are either possibly overinflated. I have no doubt that these will probably continue to climb if uh, if the central banks keep printing. But along with that as well. Talking about the trillions of dollars in uh, money that's in currency markets and treasuries, they're being penalized by a new environment of negative interest rates and massive amounts of printing. I'll say that as well, guys, as you guys are holding your cryptocurrency assets, one thing I'd like to share with you all again that you guys probably know about already is our sponsor tax bit. So as you guys are going through the tax season, I know we've had the extended tax season with everything going on with the crisis we've had over the last few months uh, that's led to the tax season extending. You guys should definitely check out TaxBit to simplify your tax documents if you guys haven't done so already. The IRS is hitting down pretty hard this year on cryptocurrencies, so if you haven't paid your taxes, definitely check it out. Check out TaxBit. You can plug in all your exchanges through a mix of API keys across all exchanges. You can make it so that they can't trade or anything. It's just simply viewing your account balance and being able to see your trades. So you can actually put it all in one document and send it off and make sure that you understand how much you owe in regards to your taxes this year. All right. Anyways, that's it for the video, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, drop a like. It's always appreciated. But until then, I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.